Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode 15, A Flash of Green by John D. McDonald. And hello and welcome once again to Point Blank. Joining me as always, here's Justin. How are you doing today, Justin? I'm doing pretty good today, Captain Kurt. Uh, it's sunny out after a long spell of gray, rainy weather, which is not very common here in Albuquerque. The sun's out, it's 70 degrees, and I just had a nice walk to my favorite Vietnamese restaurant. Well, that sounds pretty good. And unfortunately, like most Seattle Falls, it's kind of gray and rainy here again today. But we are going to the sunshine of Florida for Florida Crime Fiction and John D. McDonald. So what book are we discussing today, Justin, and and what did you think of it? (laughs) Well, that's a loaded question, isn't it? It is. So A Flash of Green, this this book, I'll give you a summary in a moment, but uh, this is a book that... It's, it's funny that we tend to pick these transition books for some of these authors that are new to us. Uh, we did a transition book for Ross McDonald, the other famous noir McDonald, in discussing the Doomsters. Uh, it was a transition book uh, between two types of his writing styles. And I have a feeling that the book we picked, A Flash of Green, is also doing that for John D. McDonald, transitioning from his early days as a pulp writer uh, into his later days as a writer of the Travis McGee novels. So it was, it's a weird one, and I think that's going to lead to some interesting conversations. Uh, but would you like me to give a, a brief summary of, of the book? Sure, uh, a brief summary would be nice, and uh, unlike the book, your summary will be brief, so we'll all be in for a treat there. Let's hope so. So, uh, the main discussion today is going to be John D. McDonald's A Flash of Green, and boy, did we muck this one up. Published in 1962, A Flash of Green precedes McDonald's best-known creation, as I said, the, the character of Travis McGee. He doesn't actually arrive on the scene until 1964's The Deep Blue Goodbye. But this is interesting because it was one of the first books to focus on real estate and the effects of real estate booms on the environment. Uh, of course, taking place in, in the Gulf Coast of Florida, this is a, a situation that is all too common there, especially in the 60s uh, in, in the advent of air conditioning. Uh, housing complexes went up uh, left and right all over the place. And this is one of the first books to actually explore environmentalism as a theme uh, and as something that's significant as opposed to just accepting uh, real estate development as progress pure and simple, a positive thing. This sort of critiqued it. And that wasn't very common at the time. 1962, uh, Rachel Carson and Silent Spring and the environmental movement, those were things that were very much young in early stages at that moment. So this book comes out and does a pretty cool thing in that it explores this pretty much undiscussed theme. That said, I appreciate McDonald's cojones and awareness to develop a book that talks about these things that I value, However, I wish he would have made a more exciting book on the topic. Pretty much, this is a book about three major characters. I guess you'd call the protagonist a guy named Jimmy Wing. He's a journalist. He lives in the city of Palm, Palm City, which is a sleepy town on Florida's Gulf Coast. I think it's pretty much a stand-in for the, for the town of Sarasota, Florida, where I've been. It's a lovely town. And Sarasota Bay, which is a real bay, uh, serves as the uh, real-life stand-in for Grassy Bay, which is the, the, the bay that's uh, featured in this book and sort of takes center stage in this battle between developers and environmentalists. Uh, the other two characters we have in this book are Cat Hubble, who is a local gal with a heart of gold. She's a widow raising two kids, and she's an activist with Save Our Bay. And lastly, we have Elmo Bliss, who's a rich, powerful local real estate tycoon with political ambitions. He's a total asshole, but he's also complex and interesting because John McDonald makes him so. Essentially, the premise is Cat doesn't want to see this new development get built on Grassy Bay. She uh, and a team have uh, once defeated development on Grassy Bay, but uh, as it tends to happen, de- developers have reared their ugly heads again and are trying to uh, build a new project, this time with local support. 
So she tries to get Jimmy Wing to support her efforts, just like her deceased husband uh, would have done because her deceased husband was a uh, activist. But she uh, doesn't really win Wing over. Wing is a journalist and tries to play the middle road, but ends up in the pocket of Elmo Bliss, uh, who I like to think of as Boss Hog in the story, even though uh, he doesn't look like him. Pretty much the deal is that Boss Hog pays off Jimmy Wing to play the pro-development side on the local paper. This goes against Jimmy's inclinations, but his wife's in a, in a mental asylum, and he's depressed and sort of pathetic, so he tosses his moral scruples, if he had any to begin with, into the salt breeze. He also has a crush on Cat Hubble, but she doesn't really like him, and her husband used to be his friend, and of course I, he has uh, recently passed, so that creates another weird little wrinkle uh, between them. Pretty much the rest of the story is the battle between Elmo Bliss's band of greedy locals and the white middle-class environmentalists of Save Our Bay. I would love to continue, but I think I want to stop there and not spoil too much because we're going to return to it, uh, of course, in our next episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts at this point. I'm going to be very uh, upfront about that. I didn't really care for this book that much. For a 450-page book, there's not a whole lot that happens uh, driving the plot. Uh, it's very, very slow in, in revealing um, what's happening. So I think it's interesting as an artifact. It's interesting as a novel from a very specific time and place when uh, the environmental movement uh, would be a new thing. It would be unfamiliar with a lot of people. Um, the types of tactics between a, a big business interest and a small citizen a concern, group of concerned citizens would be perhaps novel and interesting to the reader. Given that that time frame, there would be more going on here. But for a modern reader who, who has heard this story many times before, the plot just, it, it, it drags a lot. So I think for our listeners, this is the first time I'm going to do this, but I would suggest that you read a plot summary of this book. It is, it's interesting to know about. It's in, it is transitional, as Justin said, and I think it's influential as part of McDonald's bigger body of work into Florida crime fiction and into more modern types of crime fiction tales. But this book on its own, I think you'd be better off reading something else of John D. McDonald or read some Travis McGee or something, something um, along those lines. I don't know why, but but McDonald himself, this was one of his favorite novels, and I, I don't get that whatsoever, but, you know, whatever. I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it says something about John D. McDonald, what his aspirations were or how he viewed his work, because you, you would assume that what he likes is going to be uh, classic McDonald, uh, however he defines that. Uh, however, it seems to be this this odd sort of odd duck in his canon, which he prefers, which may, brings to mind some of the other authors uh, we've had who perhaps had these literary aspirations and ended up, quote unquote, getting stuck writing crime fiction. I wonder if he felt that way. I didn't get that impression, but perhaps that that sort of factors in because this definitely reads more like like a mainstream fiction novel. For a crime novel, there's not much going on in it, but for a mainstream fiction novel where there's a lot of characters talking to each other and you get to really uh, embed yourself in the setting there's it's so slow moving and it's so focused on domestic drama that you almost get the impression that he was trying to write to a new audience it was published by Simon um, Simon and Schuster which isn't a crime you know press so I wonder if that's why he's drawn to it because he broke out of his sort of the pulp ghetto that he had spent so much time in that could be part of it yeah, I mean, that is one thing to think about with McDonald is that even though he's most known for his crime writing, he did write a across a number of genres, and he can't be completely uh, boxed in as a crime writer. So yeah, the re whole reason we picked this book is because I saw in a reference book that this was credited as the first crime novel to address environmental issues in the crime fiction uh genre. And I thought that was that was pretty interesting. And so for for that it's interesting, but I think you're you're right. It's it's a crime it's an it's a novel with crime, but not for a necessarily crime fiction or certainly not noir audience. Yes. So, yeah, I I totally concur with you in that I wouldn't recommend our readership to read this as an example of Florida noir or any 
type of crime fiction, given that the books that we choose to feature are not are, are books that are exemplary, or at least they attempt to be. We try to make them so. In this case, I think this is, I'm willing to admit this is my first fail. I expected the book to be far better than it is. Had we had the opportunity to do a do-over, I would have, like you had mentioned, picked probably a deep blue goodbye or one of the Travis McGee novels and seen how that sat with us. I would agree. I, I do think, though, for our listeners, like, just because we didn't like this book doesn't mean we're not going to have a lot to talk about in part two, because I do think there's a lot of elements found in this book that McDonald is going to build on in the McGee series, and then you're going to see a whole bunch of Florida crime writers, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes in Subject Unknown, who use a lot of the themes that McDonald is mentioning in this book as the building blocks for for their crime fiction. You know, people like Carl Hyacin, James James Hall, and quite a few. Yeah, a whole oh a, a whole laundry list. I mean, Florida crime fiction is sort of its own its own subgenre for sure. A lot of them are crediting McDonald's work and the I, the themes that he brings up as core to what they're trying to bring to the table. And even if we might not be so on board with the plot of this book and maybe we find that it's slogs along in a way that we're not used to in crime fiction. I mean, the writing itself, uh, John McDonald can write like he, he does some great description. He's a master of dialogue. You really get a feel of languid, hot Florida in the summertime. And I mean, it really, he does that a good job of capturing that on the page. So there's a lot of good stuff just as general interest as people who like good writing. There's a lot of good writing in this book. It's just a question of the plot. Sure, and we'll get into a lot of this in uh, part two of this episode. For sure. Which will be coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, Shall we move into our featured review for this episode, Justin? Totally. I'm totally up for it. Uh, We got a a fun book uh, for our featured review. Um, Just as a reminder, our featured reviews are books that have been, it's sort of like a solicitation where we we are open to uh, accepting people's writings and we're willing to consider reviewing them so long as we both agree that we like them and want to take a chance on it. So we encourage anybody who has a book or a film that's in the category of noir, crime fiction, hard-boiled, if uh, you want us to give it a look over and see if it's uh, something that strikes us, uh, we're, we're more, more than likely to review it if that's the case. Of course, there are no guarantees, and, and we will not review a thing if we d- don't consent on liking it uh, equally or to the extent that we should. So, But this book makes the cut, and this is a Joe Clifford's Junkie Love. Had you read this book before, Kurt, or was this new for you? No, this was new for me. I was familiar with Joe Clifford, and I had read, uh, I'd done a review for Five Round Burst of um, Lamentations. Oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I kind of had a sense of what I was going to get from Joe Clifford, and, you know, I, I have to say I did enjoy this one. I know you you told me that uh, this is one of his stronger books, and I have to agree. And a part of that is has got to be because it's so uh, autobiographical. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this book strikes close to home, uh, and it's though it's billed as fiction, Junkie Love is a fictional tale, but obviously some of the best fictional writing uh, strikes closer to the heart of truth than, than, than something that might be called a memoir or autobiography. So... Uh, Joe Clifford also has a Florida connection. He went to Florida International University for his MFA, and it was at that program that he learned how to refine his writing skills, and Junkie Love came out just a few years after he had graduated. So uh, there we go, another Florida tie-in, which is a nice way to segue. Uh, Let me give you a little sort of spiel on what Junkie Love is and and why we decided to uh, spend time with it. Uh, This was originally published by Battered Suitcase Press in 2013, but the thing is a a new edition was recently released, second printing or whatnot, with with a special new foreword and all that, and because they were marketing that around, that's why we picked it up this time. I had read it in the past, uh, soon after it came out, uh, gave it a a once-over and really found it to be uh, captivating, uh, nice hard-boiled prose, and a compelling narrative. Uh, this book, like I said, is is billed as a hard-boiled novel, but really it's an autobiography. It's set in San Francisco in the late 90s and early aughts. This is a time that no longer exists. San Francisco has radically changed from then to now. People can't uh, live there, can't afford to live there unless they're in the Tenderloin District. So this was a time that sort of captured and, and preserved in this, in this set of collection uh, narratives from Joe Clifford. While the city is central to the story, this is 
really a story about a character. Let's just call him Joe. He doesn't really have a name in the story. Uh, he comes from he comes west from Connecticut to the city on the bay with rock and roll fantasies. He's going to make it big and follow a uh, sort of crossover between us. Bruce Springsteen and Jack Kerouac, I feel like those were his influences at the time. He has romantic notions of meth and heroin use too, uh, but he's by no means an addict or consumed by either drug. This is a story, however, about a character who falls hard for speed, the speed of, of living on his own, uh, the speed of this ro- new world and the rock and roll fantasies that he personifies, and then the speed of meth and narcotics and, and that whole life and struggle. And, he, of course, he nearly dies more than once. He tries to keep it together throughout the narrative. He's trying to make it to the other side. But this is a story of, of the downfall of somebody and then his unlikely redemption. Most people don't escape the web of addiction, of course, but this character does. He does not, what I like about this book is he does not glamorize drug use. I mean, sure, there are moments. I hark back to my 20s and go, oh, man, like I I had those feelings. You know, it really hits home. But he shows just how quickly and how difficult the experience is of succumbing to to, uh, narcotic or any type of abuse situation, the need for it, the lack of money, the lies you start to tell yourself and tell others. And we see these struggles in all their gritty detail. Again, we see Joe stealing. We see him cheating, lying, fucking his way from one high to the next, conning banks out of dough, hawking his friend's guitars, bilking his mother, not once, not twice, three, four, five, six, a dozen, two dozen times. And when things are at their most dire, he injects mouse shit into his bloodstream in the hope that it's black tar heroin. These are harrowing scenes, and they're captivating. You, they, they draw you in, and they don't let go. And you wonder how the hell this guy's going to make it out, uh, knowing full well that he's the author. Uh, but Jesus, you know, it's just shocking. People don't usually survive these circumstances, and especially in San Francisco in the late 90s, uh, people were not surviving intravenous drug use uh, without getting HIV. So even that aspect was a lucky break for our narrator. But like I said, this is a story of redemption. He comes close and sees death. He looks it in the mirror more than once. Nothing is glorified. We see his illusions get swept away one by one until toward the end he's emaciated, scabby, and alone. He tries to suicide via heroin injection, but he can't even do that right. Because it doesn't work, we have this book. It's a story about love, his romantic relationships with with women, uh, with music, but mostly with drugs, his desire, his dreams, his redemption, a suburban American kid with romantic delusions, taking huge risks and nearly dying, but managing to break through it. Uh, He doesn't spend the whole book focused on his drug use, the the last section, you'd say the probably act three is his redemption period where he goes to rehab. Uh, this is his 17th or 18th time in rehab, but we get to sit with him and watch him undergo the experience and get to see what it looks like and get to see him slowly break through the delusions and, 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 and lies that he's told himself. And he comes out at the end clean. This is a novel in fragments, which is sort of a cool formatting. He doesn't just say, here's me driving to San Francisco, and at the end, here's me in rehab. I think he, he breaks it up for a couple reasons. And one, because drugs eat at your memory like a, moths eat a cloth. So I think he would have to think about the book in terms of fragments because that's how he remembers it. Uh, I also think it helps to keep the narrative propulsive. There's, there's movement in it. There's action and plotting that is deliberately placed in, in an order so that we feel like we are holding on to our seats and, and, and riveted and curious about what comes next. So I think that was a tactful move on his part. It shows his creative writing awareness in terms of fiction craft. I mean, there's a lot of cool things that happen in this book. I would love to go back and forth briefly, Kurt, and just uh, what are the highlights for you? And yeah, well, I, I have to say, first of all, when you brought this book to my attention, I was, I don't want to say, say skeptical, but maybe a bit skeptical, because I do have sort of a, I don't know, an aversion to this, the standard, like, druggy tale, you know, that a lot of times they, as he w- actually very well points out in the book, um, they glorify the drug use, and they don't really talk about the downside. And I, I was concerned about that going into this book, but I knew, you know, there was more of a story. And I was very pleased to see that that's not really, you know, that it's, it's very clearly not glorified in this novel. I mean, I think he captures the filth, uh, the risk, and the and that struggle with addiction extremely well. And, and kind of, you know, I guess 
to say the sort of topic that only someone who has true experience with with those well those life choices is going to be able to put those words on the page in in the convincing way that he he has you know for me it feels real and i know that he says well you know this is it's a work of fiction uh it's based on on some of my memories some of it's made up some of it's been changed but it, it what came to mind is uh I believe it's in the intro to the book, uh, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, a lot of people really love that book, and I do too. But he has a, a thing in the introduction there where he talks about how the stories are true even if they didn't happen. And he ta- he's referring, of course, to the Vietnam War and war stories and a lot of the aftermath of the war. But his point is when you've gone through this experience— it's really the emotional thing that is true. It's it's not the, it's not the factual what day and what time kind of things that are important. It's it's the emotional experience, and I think Clifford really really captures that in Junkie Love. I was glad to see that, and I was glad to see that he didn't completely eliminate the I guess the high of being high. That you know there there's reasons why people like drugs, and you know they but they have a very you know a very hard cost. And, and what I do think is is really great, and and it is we're ta- definitely talking about a druggy subculture, but he is also starts in as you know being in the music scene and whatnot, and you kind of alluded to this as well. Is I think he captures the mystique of essentially any underground uh, subculture, whether that be skating or punk or metal or you know you name it, uh, all, all of these subgenres that kind of skirt with. I don't know, want to say doing illegal activity, but illegalism, sure. um, where they're subverting culture. Yeah, some and, kind of counterculture or subversion element to it, where it's not been widely or popularly accepted. Yeah, and and in a sense of where you know there is a, a, a potential to skirt that line, where because a lot of the you know thinking about the punk scene, like there's a lot of people who you know who end up becoming addicted to heroin from being in the punk scene and that's unfortunate and you see that in in a lot of music scenes and skateboarding and and all that kind of stuff and i think he captured that very real and you know it was interesting and powerful because being loosely associated with some of those subcultures you know I, i i know a lot of people who walk that knife edge and some who fell off and you know it's it's unfortunate that that happens but i think i think he captures that experience very well in this book and it's of course, it's it's far more common for people to fall off the knife edge, as you put it, and and not make it. Of course, many people do. Many people get out of it. But how many of them end up going to get their MFA in creative writing with the intent of being able to tell that story? That's an incredible rare thing, which is why this book is so special. Yeah, It's that not only did he make it, but he was able to then continue his education and develop this specific skill set to tell his story so effectively. Because it could have just been a bombastic, shitty rant about his past in fragments, but without the art. Uh, but he was able to uh, develop it into something that will last. And yeah, you, like you said, the subculture thing is tricky. And it was nice to be brought into that. And he tried to show that world to captivate us and to show why the rationale behind it. It wasn't just drugs for the sake of burying the dark, dark experiences from the past. It was also the allure, that attraction, like a like a moth to to a flame that that's there's an attractiveness to it and we can't deny that uh but the the consequences are real and he he gave us very very visual examples of what that looks like from hepatitis heights uh the druggy house that with the dea raid that started the book off to later on when he's walking around in connecticut in the winter uh, having been essentially dumped and abandoned by his junkie girlfriend and uh, having nothing left to do but to steal money from his mother and to buy like five hundred dollars worth of heroin and inject it all at once Uh, that's the end of the story effectively and that's where it it could have ended and might and would you would have expected it to end at that point for most people somehow he escaped a lethal dose and he's around and it's just, it's sort of mind boggling. So this is a testament. This is pretty much a, you know, a coming back from the dead type of story. And uh, for that reason alone, um, it's pretty, pretty good. I think Clifford says in the introduction that most of the, the worst elements uh, that happen in this book are from his experience and good for him for digging out of it and, and giving us this uh, really powerful book on his experience. 
And while it's not, I wouldn't call it noir because it's a redemptive story, it is definitely hard-boiled. The writing itself, he, he's, a, he's a crime fiction writer. He's written a, a series, uh, like you said, Lamentation was the first in that series uh, that's set in New Hampshire, and it's noir and winter and, and dark and mysterious and seedy. Uh, he's also written a couple of one-off uh, noir hard-boiled tales. And this definitely is written like a hard-boiled story. It's got that gritty, raw, Hemingway school type of writing style. And that's why I think it works for us as a, as a feature. If it was just like lurid, lyrical, drug tale, it wouldn't quite work for our show. But it's the writing style and Clifford's, uh, how, he, how he fits into the, to the hard-boiled canon that makes it, I think, a, a good fit for us. Yeah, for sure. This is, this is a gritty uh, novel. Indeed. So uh, yeah, I definitely uh, recommend it, and it's worth a, worth a read. Subject unknown. Unknown. Welcome once again to Subject Unknown, and Subject Unknown is where we take a well, a random topic uh, in the crime fiction genre and talk about it for a little bit. And this episode, we are going to look at Florida crime fiction. Because Flash of Green is uh, certainly a case of Florida crime fiction, and there's a lot of interesting elements to this. And I think, as I said in the introduction, that uh, you know that that Florida crime genre is almost almost its own thing. I mean, you could probably go to a major bookstore, and if you separated out all the Florida crime fiction, you could fill up quite a few shelves with the works that are out there. But you know, the first thing. You know, we have to look at, I think, and, and, and in part, this is for our international listeners, because I know you're out there. Why in the heck is it Florida, Justin? I know you've lived there. I've been there enough to comment on it. Uh, I work in the Gulf of Mexico, so I get a little bit of that Florida infusion. But uh, what's the attraction of writing crime in Florida? Well, I think there's a few a few reasons why it's such a fertile ground. I think we sort of hinted at one in our in our dis- discussion of Flash of Green, the fact that this population in Florida hasn't been there forever. It's not New York. It, it came around in the mid, sort of like uh, the the Western U.S. in the Southwest. These populations uh, came around in the in the mid twentieth century in the wake of air conditioning. But when when they really opened up from being these sort of uh, wayward, dismal, swamp, mosquito-infested places that just happened to be on beaches, they became top destinations. They were manufactured to attract people, and attract people they did, and they attracted all different types of people, and some of these people are effing nuts, but I think it's just the concentration of bringing a lot of different people from a lot of different places to Florida in a very short time for a lot of different reasons, some above ground and some pretty nefarious. I think that created conditions for the sort of cataclysmic weirdness that you might uh, say leads to good crime fiction. I think, for example, like, you know, the, the Twitter and Reddit meme generator that is Florida Man. You know, the Florida Man news articles, they, they always start with Florida Man. I have a few here. Shirtless Florida Man hangs out by dumpsters and recites Shakespeare. Florida Man uses own blood as weapon against police. Florida Man steals tractor, fights police officer and gets tasered. Florida Man microwaves urine. Naked Florida Man chases couple around Chick-fil-A parking lot. Florida Man arrested for taking girlfriend out to dinner on boat that isn't his, doing $1,000 worth of damage to toilet. These are just six of the billions of <laughs> examples of Florida Man and, uh, and his shenanigans. And I think this sort of wacky character, in a lot of ways, personifies some of the best Florida noir. It's, it's got a, its own little wrinkle that, that, doesn't, that you don't see in, in, like, for example, the Chandlers and the Hammets, even the Ross McDonald's. Uh, you get it a little probably with Travis McGee. But uh, some of the uh, the other Florida authors known for their crime fiction definitely deviate into some more wackadoo territory. And I think that that's one of the things that makes Florida stuff unique. Yeah, there's definitely a wacky element. And maybe that's the attraction in, in a lot of ways for some of the authors, because you can get away with having these wacky crimes take place in Florida, which... The reader, I mean, they still don't necessarily make sense, but the reader is willing to uh, allow more leeway in Florida than they were, say, if that uh, that same piece of uh, writing took place in Illinois, for example. Yeah, and 
some of it's the audience, I, I, I guess. Um, but you just don't get the uh, the middle. The Midwest has its own tenor. Uh, the, there's a reservedness yeah. to it. We've talked about when we've talked about Minnesota and Fargo and the Scandinavian connection. And obviously, the Scandinavian stuff that we've read is is not. I wouldn't call it wacky. It's very serious, you know. No, uh, the Florida noir is really the first thing that we've focused in on where wackiness is almost a key element of the genre. Totally. I mean, yeah. just look. Just looking at some of the names of, of the writers that we have here, you know, we have Carl Hyacin, who I know you have mixed feelings about. We have Tim Dorsey. Both of them are big names in this. Both of them have always have wacky stories going on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's basically if somebody, you know, somebody is not eaten by an alligator in one of these crime fiction pieces, it's it's not Florida Noir. It, you know, that's like standard. It has to be in there. You know, you have humorists like like Dave Barry writing mm-hmm. Florida crime fiction. Um, and, you know, it is there's a lot of seriousness, too, um, as you you did that review of Miami Purity uh, last episode. Yeah. You know, you have things like Jim Harrison wrote a, a Good Day to Die. Origin, that part, it starts in Florida. Well, I guess Elmore Leonard. Now yep. there's a wackiness t- to his writing there as well. Maybe not as as big as Carl Hyacin's. Um, I would call the the Dexter novels. There's a degree of wackiness in that. Sure. It seems that the the only two serial killers as protagonists. Well, I mean, other than Jim Thompson, are they're set in Florida. We have we have the Dexter, uh, Jeff Lindsay's Dexter, and then we have Tim Dorsey. Isn't his main guy uh, pretty much a psychopath? I think so. Charles Williford occupies that territory. I've read some of his work, and, and I love it. And I'm looking forward to spending some time with him on this show, maybe for our round two of uh, our Florida Noir. Um, but, for sure. But he, um, and uh, David Gonzalez uh, wrote a nice piece that sort of summarizes aspects of Florida Noir. And he, he speaks to Charles Williford, who he calls his favorite. And he talks about how Williford runs the state's gamut from tales of South Baptist cockfighters and psychopathic murderers on the lam in South Beach. And I remember the first book of his I read, Miami Blues, I think. And it definitely, it's got that, just these nutty, nutty characters. If they're if if the protagonist isn't nutty, then, then the antagonist has to be. It seems to be part of the formula that makes things work. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the clash of, of this sort of old school Southern, uh, like, quote unquote, redneck culture that was Florida, that's all suddenly been thrust up against the glitz and the glam of places like South Beach with the mirrored skyscrapers and the Lamborghinis. And it's just, it's such an absurd commentary on like modern society, how those things could be smashed up together with the alligators and the airboats and like references to. Burt Reynolds, and then three, six, five, eight miles away, you got the Lamborghinis and, and, and the cocaine cowboys and all that stuff. I mean, I grew, I, I didn't grow up there. I, I went to school there and I spent three years in Miami. And man, what a weird fucking town. And I loved my time there, but I couldn't imagine staying there for long because I didn't, I was losing orientation. I was losing sense of what was real and what wasn't. It's really just, uh, it's a quagmire and it's a confusion and, and, it, and it's, something about it you just you can't figure it out what what's happening there and i think that's part of what makes the florida noir such richly weird and oftentimes really inviting and fun and a nice break from some of the more serious stuff the more sober uh crime fiction that we we are privy to yeah for sure i mean i think you're right going back to what what are the origins of florida being sort of this melting pot of weirdness and that 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 late development um, is certainly a big part of it. Is you know by that point you pretty much have long ago the the native population has been wiped out of the area, and then so you like you said you have sort of a very small um, hardy population living in the bays and and fishing and whatnot, and uh, it isn't really until modern technology makes it a livable place that people move in waves, and that that's really what you said there, that it's essentially a created habitat sure. for hum- humans. A, manu- like, a manufactured paradise. Yes, manufactured, exactly. Yeah, so it, it really it really gets at those elements of escapism. It attracts greed and corruption. It de- attracts development. It's a land of second chances for a lot of people. And when you know you have second chances, whether that's people looking to escape something else in another part of the United States... Uh, whether that's an immigrant community, whether that's uh, 
you know, criminals on the run uh, have a tendency to end up in Florida. Yeah. You know, so many people existing in, in a place that really shouldn't be habitable. And yet, you know, you drain the swamp like they talk about in this uh, particular book and you, you fill it in and you create a magic kingdom of... Uh, fake castles and and sell uh, hamburgers at it and there you go and precisely and, and it's the magic well I mean the magic city is 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 a pseudonym for Miami so you got the Miami type of scenario but like you alluded to you said magic kingdom you have Disney you got this manufactured fantasy land where people go to escape uh, and this is butting up against we said this place of last resort where criminals and other people looking to change their lives sometimes for the better get a lot of migrant communities coming from Latin America looking to get away from dangerous scenarios into and find sanctuary but then you get a lot of criminals leaving Latin American countries who have been uh, perpetrators of genocide and perpetrators of war crimes and they come to Miami also to get away and start over so you end up with all these all these sort of weird life stories converging in this space uh, while also these people who are sort of like these clueless midwesterners going down just to have a fantasy land good time it's just it's just bizarro it's one of the only places where that happens i guess california might be uh, in the running for a similar type of situation with similar types of draws um but still i think florida for florida it's just a little bit more magnified yeah, for sure. For some reason, Florida wins out in the wackiness department over California. Yeah, and um, and I can't I can't explain that exactly, but you know my favorite noir hardboiled author, Carol John Daly. He is, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. He is regarded um, at least uh, in this article by by David Gonzalez. He uh, was one of the first to really put Florida noir on the map. There had been several Florida mysteries and Florida hardboiled stories that came out as early as 1896. There was a story called what is it called? Don Belasco of Key West. It was written by A.C. Gunter and it starred. Thomas Duff Mastic, the government tax man. So this came out in 1896, and it had elements of crime and, and mystery and sort of laid the foundations. And then there were quite a few, for 20 years, mysteries and sort of pulpy detective novels that I, I never heard of any of the authors, like Edward Hurst and Bessie Merchant. Uh, they're out there if you look them up. Uh, and the first Charlie Chan mystery was set in Florida. But... It wasn't until what's his name, my guy, Carol John Daly. He brought our good fellow, our good buddy, Race Williams, the uh, loud, brash, fisticuffs wielding badass PI that uh, he really made famous through uh, publishing with Black Mask. But one of I think it was the sixth, yeah, the sixth novel that he wrote was called The Hidden Hand, and it was set in Florida, where uh, he heads down to Miami to track down a notorious Florida gang, and that apparently was sort of a big moment in noir history in Florida. And it's funny to trace it back to somebody who goes all the way to Black Mask. Uh, this this noir current runs deep. That's interesting that you you know I hadn't wasn't aware of that, but it didn't bring to mind uh, you know some of the history of Florida too is. In a lot of ways, the economy of Florida has been heavily influenced by swindles and sort of gray area economics for its most of its history, whether that's uh, going back to, uh, you know, Spanish uh, colonialism or if you want to look more recently, the old joke about, well, I've got a piece of swampland in Florida to sell you. Mm hmm. That or, you know, obviously there was a ton of drug money going through uh, Florida in the 70s and 80s and I'm sure now as well. Oh, yeah. But I was also... And, and you know me, I always have to pull in or try to look for some kind of maritime element. Back in the day, Key West was actually the, I believe it's per capita richest city in the country because they basically had an economy of having a bunch of boats waiting for vessels to wreck on the reef. And then they would race out there and then probably save the crew. But mostly they were after the cargo that was in there. And then they would lay salvage claim to it and uh, bring it back to port. So... That sounds fun. A lot of are, are there yeah, are there any yeah. books written about that history? Yes, uh, I have a several. Um, there's one called The Wreckers, and then there's like a three part uh, history of the Florida Keys, and one of them is dedicated to that. If you're in Key West, Florida, uh, there is a Wreckers Museum, there's a Pirates Museum, and then of course there's Mel Fisher's uh, Treasure Museum, and travel plans from Point Blank Podcast. Uh, if you happen to be traveling to Key West and you're there for the Wreckers Cup, they do a sailboat race uh, once a year where they get a bunch of smaller sailboats, but also all the bigger schooners and historic ships. They race out to the the reef marker, and it's like one of the only sailboat races in the world that's basically a drag race 
because it's simulating racing out to the wreck as fast as possible. Um, there's no there no buoys <laughs> to turn around or anything. That's yeah. awesome. And I was I sailed in it one time and it was a blast. Wow, that's cool. I think uh, there's there could be an argument made for uh, having our next point blank rendezvous set uh, in Key West. Uh, be a good excuse to go and check out the weird old noir tales tied to nautical and also to things like uh, Ernest Hemingway's To Have and Have Not, which was pretty damn close to a hard boiled noir. Uh, novel as close as he ever got and it's set in sure. key west and involves smuggling boating be- and and revolutionary activity during the depression between havana and key west and i i'm actually really excited about reading it one of these days for for point blank because i think there's a lot of really cool stuff in it yeah i've read it read it before too thanks to you actually and i really enjoy it as well so, so we might have to put that on the list yeah well we'll talk about that another time but definitely i think that uh these things make Florida unique and makes this ground very fertile. I don't think the book that we've been discussing uh, for this episode quite uh, fills in or, or exemplifies uh, the the more quintessential features of Florida noir. But the environmental theme that it does contain is a u- more unique Florida thing because they're not the only ones. Uh, John D. McDonald might have introduced environmentalism into his it, crime fiction, but uh, it was people like James W. Hall, uh, Les Standiford, and several other writers who have fought to include that in, in their own writing, made it a feature of either their protagonist character. For example, James W. Hall's main character, Thorne, in his set of novels, uh, there's a couple dozen of them or something. Uh, Thorne is sort of like a Thoreau-like character, which has definitely a, a predecessor um, or a successor to Travis McGee, and but with his own his own little flair and his own little you know habits. And he's in, he lives in Key Largo, and that's that character is directly related to John D. McDonald and uh, typifies a lot of the Florida noir. That isn't totally wacky. You bring up something there, Justin, that I'm going to throw in a mini contest to our listeners. If you have read the Thorn novels and you can find the Easter egg that refers to the Point Blank podcast, I will give you a $25 gift certificate <laughs> for a bookstore. Ooh, that's, that's all we're going to say. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Okay, enough said on that. Let's talk a little bit about John D. Uh, McDonald as, you know, just his life and a little bit about him. And I have to say, first of all, you know, it's it's not just this book. There's something about McDonald's biography that I just don't find as compelling as many of the other authors that we've talked about. I, for the most part, I looked uh, and read a book called The, the Red Hot typewriter by Hugh uh, Merrill. And it's a decent biography. There's no problem there. I just don't find uh, McDonald's path as exciting as some of the other authors that we've talked about. Well, first of all, he was born in uh, in Pennsylvania in 1916. Um, He lives until 1986. And he dies in Milwaukee, Wisconsin after complications with heart surgery. And at the time of his death, he had sold 70 million books, which is pretty staggering, really. He had written 66 novels and 400 short stories. He would be called a grandmaster by the Mystery Writers of America. I think there's a, a part about him that I find less compelling because he sort of reminds me of the mass market paperback or what I like to call airplane book authors that we have today. And, and not that these people's lives are are boring, but I'm thinking of people like Cl- Clive Cussler, Lee Child, Tom Clancy, James Patterson. Mm-hmm. And I think it's particularly James Patterson that he reminds me of. And it's this business-like mentality of how he looks at his writing. I mean, to turn out that many books, he was many times to me, he comes across as a quantity over quality type of guy. And once he settles in and being in, a, in as a writer in Sarasota, Florida, he really doesn't do a whole lot that I can tell. But anyway, let's let's get into a little bit of his life. His father was uh, Eugene McDonald. His mother's name was Catherine. Uh, they came from a Scottish background and that that sort of Scottish uh, sk- stereotype of, of work and penny pinching and whatnot. Uh, his father did uh, have a fairly decent job and he he eventually he was making good money but he was abusive uh, to both uh, John and his particularly his mother 
like actually quite a few of the authors that we've looked at, he has a childhood illness that makes uh, scarlet fever, which makes him bedridden for a year. And that's when he really starts to read ex- extensively. Um, a lot of classics, a lot of modern classics. He's reading things like Faulkner and Hemingway, and you can see that that obviously had an influence on his writing style later on. In 1932, he graduates from high school, and he's given the choice of a year of prep school or if he wants to go on a tour of Europe. And he goes to Europe. And this is right at the rise of, uh, of Nazism in Germany. And it was interesting that he, he noted his father asked him what he remembered about the trip, and he simply said, the sound of marching feet from the cradle to the grave is what he, he thought of Europe at the time. And Wow, that's pretty dramatic. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We've heard, we've seen that from a number of authors who visited Europe in this time frame, that many of them saw the writing on the wall uh, well before the war. I mean, in the early to mid-30s, not the late 30s. So certainly, you know, it was, it was much more obvious, I think, than maybe as us modern uh, readers of history might might be led to believe. So he comes back and he gets some manual labor job. And this is something his father really pushes on him because his father worked his way up and he thinks John has to do the same thing. He goes to study a business and economics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he lasts about a year and a half before he drops out and goes to New York City. Uh, well, this is this is the mid '30s. It's the height of the Depression, and uh, lo and behold, John doesn't have a very good good luck finding manual labor jobs. So he's there a couple of months, and then he goes back to Syracuse University to continue studying business. There, he would meet his future wife, uh, Dordo. I think that's how he says it, uh, which is weird to me. D O R D O, or her real name is uh, Dorothy Prentice. But anyway, the two of them get together and. He goes to Harvard, and throughout this, even though his father and his mother could have certainly helped him out more in this time period than they did, his father had this ethic of which he wanted, not only did he want to see his son work his way up, but he also wanted to see his son suffer in the same way that he had to gain what gain his wealth. So that was obviously an issue for John throughout his life. He never had a very close relationship with his father. So he goes to Harvard, gets his MBA. And he, he can't find, this is strange to me too, that you graduate from Harvard with an MBA and uh, you can't find a job. Um, so he joins the he joins the army and he becomes an ordnance officer. And this is before World War II. Once the war breaks out, he's sent to Southeast Asia. Uh, he's sent to India, Sri Lanka, Burma, that theater. Mm-hmm. Basically an ordnance guy. He does work with uh, special uh, operations a little bit. But there's some writing from this period where you can tell that McDonald is a bit of a colonialist in his uh, mentality of, of living in the area, which is interesting because later in life he would attempt to write about race in America and would fail and not really ever try to, to do it, even though he's, he feels in, in some letters he suggests that he wants to try it, but he just he, he's not willing to do the work, bring that to the page. I never got the impression of him like some of the other authors that he had that he had that sort of red or left streak in him from an early age. You know, we had our Jim Thompson and Dash Hammett sort of uh, flirtations with socialism and, and, and the working class. And it seems that John D. McDonald sort of eluded that phase of his of his growing up period. Yeah, that's correct. And I would I would call his politics sort of like moderate Democrat. And I believe he was a member of the Democratic Party for most of his life. But yeah, certainly not one of these uh, left-wing radicals like we've seen in in some of our other crime fiction authors. Mm-hmm. But it's in the army that he his wife encourages him to start writing because he's dealing with some depression there. And that's when he he writes his first short story that would get published in a pulp magazine. He comes back to the United States and, and decides that he's going to be a writer. And here again, and this, I mean, I just find this astonishing. I don't know if you do as well, Justin, but... The amount of writing that a lot of these people are doing in this time frame, in four months, he writes 800,000 words, and he submits enough stuff to get 1,000 rejections in four months. No, it's just, that's insanity sauce. I mean, I remember when we, we had the episode on the Black Mask Boys, and we were we were astounded over the quantity of the Earl Stanley Gardners and even the, the John Carroll Dailies. And I think it was part of the, this pop culture of, it's almost like a drug. You got to keep going. You can't get enough because you got to make 
pay. Uh, you got to pay the bills, but it's it's more than just that. I feel I feel like that drive is is a special a special thing, a special characteristic of only certain people who are capable um, writers with this drive. I mean, not every writer can pull this stuff off. I know I could not, and I know quite a few people. I just I don't understand that kind of productivity. I mean, for quite a long time, he was just a plain old pulp writer. So uh, I mean, he's definitely. I'm surprised that he didn't feature in to our conversation about Black Mask very much. Well, you know, it's when she's interesting here is that there is a Black Mask connection because once he gets recognized as a pulp author, uh, he picks up the an agent, and that agent is uh, our old friend Captain Joseph Shaw. Shaw, of, uh, Black Mask. He made so many yes. careers, didn't he? He certainly did, and and here he is uh, with his hands in another one. This is. Pretty late in Captain Shaw's career, but he certainly has the connections to get McDonald in places that will get him noticed. So that is a huge, huge step in Donald's career. Throughout this time, as especially as a pulp writer, he's he's jumping around. He's not making tons of money. He's making enough to support the family, but they kind of move between New York and they end up in Mexico for a little while. And then it's in 1949 that they come to Florida. That's where he would basically stay with some summers up. They had a cabin in New York, but most of his life then would stay in Florida and they would settle in Sarasota uh, in 1951. And right in that period is when he writes his first true novel is is The Brass Cupcake. I I don't know about that name, but hey, that's your your first novel. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't it wasn't a breakthrough, but it was it was his first novel instead of writing Pulp Fiction. Sarasota would definitely be in influential on him because, first of all, Sarasota is interesting in the fact that it was essentially established as the winter town for the uh, Ringling Brothers Circus. Oh yeah. So it was a, t- yeah, it was a town that attracted ex- eccentrics, artists, writers, um, interesting people. I've I've seen I've seen the uh, the circus down there when I was a kid. Their winter home was in when I was young. It was in Venice. Uh, where my grandparents lived for a while, and that's just about 20 miles south of Sarasota. We saw the cir- circus there. You would see the, the Ringling Brother cars lined up on their on their train track, sort of uh, into a, a sort of a dead end. You'd just see them gathered there, and you'd, you'd hear the rumors of the, where the animals are. And, you know, this is before the circus became... Uh, the tables turned on the circus in terms of ethics, uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I remember being sort of fantasized. You know, it, that was fantastic to me as a five year old. Like, wow, this is where the circus lives. It's such an odd thing. Yeah, that must have been interesting for sure. And I can imagine it attracting, uh, you know, the sort of eccentrics that you would associate with a, a traveling circus. In probably many subtle ways, influenced uh, McDonald's writing. And then also then influences why Florida noir or Florida crime fiction has this notion of, of wackiness involved in it. I, I'd be interested to see what what references, say, in, in the Travis McGee series uh, are directly influenced, influenced by the characters who live in Sarasota. Mm-hmm. His first breakthrough novel is in 1952, and that's The, uh, the Damned. It's this is this is the first one that's starting to get noticed, and it's interesting because it comes out at a time when there is a backlash against paperback books uh, by the U.S. Congress. And you know, here's a similar story that we've heard over and over again: is a new form of entertainment comes out, and um, Congress has to get concerned because it's corrupting the youth and causing moral damage. Well, for all of you with paperbacks in your home. Um, in 1952, the Congress of the United States would be very concerned about the uh, contents of your corrupting literature and its its possibilities as pornography. So that's sort of the atmosphere in which uh, McDonald is publishing at that time. And, and right around this time also, McDonald is part of a writer's group. And here's another one of these things where the truth is stranger than the fiction, and it's, it's, it's hard to understand the authors doing this sort of thing today. So he writes the book, The Executioner, which would be better known as Cape Fear, which was made into a film. And and here's another crazy one for you, Justin. As a writer, would you take this bet? I'll make you a $50 bet that in 30 days, you cannot write a real novel that, first of all, becomes serialized in a magazine, is selected as a book club selection, and a movie is made. Hmm. That would be sort of like uh, the fantasy uh, of writers, the ultimate fantasy, and 
it's a fantasy because of its utter impossibility. Yes, and here's something that John D. McDonald accomplished. He took that bet, he wrote a book in less than 30 days, and it became uh, what is known as Cape Fear. Well, that's his Harvard MBA at work, I guess. I, I guess so. Um, I don't know. In 1962, he writes the book that we're talking about in this uh, episode series. And then in 1964, the first Travis McGee book comes out. And that's kind of where I'm going to end his timeline, because I think if we come back to talk about McDonald again, it's going to be over a, a Travis McGee novel and uh, not one of his standalones. But we'll see. Uh, but McGee is his legacy character. That's where he has the most book published. He has the most cultural references. And it's it's really, you know, so many other writers have referenced the McGee series as influential to their work. Overall, the biggest legacy of McDonald is he's one of the writers. And we talked about this with Ross McDonald. But John D. McDonald is another crime writer who transitions the crime story into the modern world and starts letting it talk about the things that that are maybe more relevant to a, a modern reader today than the types of crime they were talking about in the 20s and 30s. Yeah, Travis McGee was no cardboard cutout uh, protagonist. Um, he's intelligent, introspective. We all spend time with him uh, another another round, but definitely in the vein of Ross McDonald. And these two were competitors, including uh, having a little snit over uh, who should have the McDonald name. Um, but both of them wrote captivating, sort of complex uh, leading men for their for their crime novels, and and that was uh, the, definitely I guess we would call it the second wave of private eye hard boiled fiction in the United States. So we'll we'll get back to it. So I think that might be a good time to end today's episode, and we'll get into a little bit more about the work of John D. McDonald and how that comes through in a flash of green next time. Definitely, if you do want to read a flash of green. You still have a couple weeks to uh, dig in. Uh, I would say skim it lightly. Uh, it's it's a slog at 454 pages. But another thing I wanted to mention is that we do have a new Goodreads point blank group. Uh, Goodreads.com. It's a place where people go to sort of store their books and discover new reads. We have a, a new group set up where people can discuss the current months, the current episodes, featured stories. For example, Flash of Green is already being discussed right now. Also, we put our featured books up there, and we each put one of our five-round burst books into that group to uh, raise awareness and get people to comment on it. Uh, so sort of like it's sort of like continuing the conversation we start in the podcast, carrying it over to the Goodreads. We also have a Facebook group, but this is corollary to that, and we thought it might actually pull in more people. Uh, and it was thanks to our our, our friend Jeff in, in, in the UK uh, helped set that up for us. So uh, we tip our hat to him. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And if you want to read ahead, if you've already read John D. McDonald and you want to move on, our next uh, episode, episode 16, we're going to be reading Walter Mosley's Devil in a Blue Dress. And the episode after that, episode 17, we go back into some older, darker, shorter, noir, Dorothy Hughes in a lonely place. So I, I, we got a pretty cool lineup coming, coming ahead, and I can't wait to dive into some of these shorter shorter pieces after after the last two books. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. And I do also want to really plug that Goodreads group. I think that's going to be a good format for our listeners. We've already got about, I want to say about 40 people who are part of that group. As we get more listeners as uh, involved, uh, we're going to be trying to get your comments on the books uh, before we record the episode. So that's going to be something uh, that you can participate in by joining that group. And that's a little easier to do there than it is on Facebook. So uh, we can have an actual discussion, uh, more like a forum, on the Goodreads page. And I'll try to put a link to that in our show notes. And if you want to get in touch with the show, you can find us on Facebook at Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. You can send us an email at pointblanknoir at gmail.com. You can tweet us at Point Blank Noir. Or you can uh, jump in an airplane, fly to Seattle or Albuquerque and... Uh, scream our names. Scream, yes. Just wander down the street screaming our names. That'll be perfect. You won't be out of place. 
No. <laughs> also, if if you uh, are uh, getting the podcast from iTunes and you like us, give us a rating. Uh, we love those ratings. They really help to, I don't know, boost our self-esteem. Yes, they do. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. See you next time, folks. Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders. Thank you.